Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the theatre at Parliament House, Canberra. Um, we meet here today where people have met for thousands of years. So I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us today in the theatre or watching online. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, my name's Richard Pye. I'm the Clerk of the Senate. Uh, for those that do know me, I'm still Richard Pye and the <laughs> Clerk of the Senate. Um, today's lecture um, in the Senate lecture series is the seventh annual lecture in honour of Harry Evans, the late Harry Evans, the longest serving Clerk of the Senate. Um, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to members of the Evans family who have joined us here again for this special occasion. Um, I also acknowledge and welcome my immediate predecessor, Dr Rosemary Lang, um, and I welcome all of you in our audience in person and online. Uh, today's lecture is being live streamed on the Australian Parliament House website and via the Parliament House broadcast system. It's also being Auslan interpreted and captioned. If time permits, the lecture will be followed by a short Q&A session. It's my great pleasure to introduce the eminent jurist and former Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, the Honourable Robert French AC, to deliver the 2023 Harry Evans Lecture. Mr French served as Chief Justice from 1 September 2008 until 29 January 2017. And immediately prior to his appointment to the High Court, he served as a judge of the Federal Court of Australia for 22 years. Following his retirement from the High Court, Mr French was appointed as a non-permanent justice of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal, an international judge of the Singapore International Commercial Court, and a judge of the Court of Appeal of the Dubai International Financial Centre. Mr French also holds honorary positions at several universities and has served as Chancellor of the University of Western Australia since December 2017. During his tenure on the High Court and in his extrajudicial commentary, Mr French has engaged extensively with issues and principles about which Harry was deeply passionate. These include the scope of Commonwealth executive power vis-à-vis -vis the legislature, constraints on expenditure, executive expenditure, federalism, representative democracy and responsible government. In today's lecture, Mr French will address this last topic, reflecting on the meaning, nature and expression of responsibility in the Australian constitutional system of government. Would you please join me in welcoming the Honourable Robert French AC to deliver the 2023 Harry Evans Lecture. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction and uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be here and to be here in the presence of the, uh, the Evans family. Uh, this paper is about responsibility in the working of our democratic institutions. Responsibility in the constitutional sense of responsible government and in a larger moral sense which is indispensable to the success of our democracy and trust in its workings by the Australian people. It acknowledges and celebrates Harry Evans as a role model of responsible commitment to that democracy and to the great public office he occupied for so long. There are three key chapters of the Australian Constitution. Chapter 1, Parliament. Chapter 2, the Executive Government. And Chapter 3, the Judicature. Part 2 of Chapter 1 concerns the Senate. It was in Part 2 of Chapter 1 and in the Senate that Harry Evans made his contribution to the working of Australian democracy as Clerk of the Senate for 21 years, from 1988 to 2009. The Senate is part of the Parliament, as reflected in Section 1 of the Constitution. And as an element of the Parliament, it is part of the lawmaking machinery under the Constitution. And it's also part of the formal structure of the system of responsible ministerial government, defined by the relationship between the executive government and the parliament. That relationship is uh, reflected in section six of the constitution which says you have to have at least one session of parliament during the year. 
Section 83 of the Constitution, which requires parliamentary approval for expenditure by the executive government of any fund or sum of money standing to the credit of the Crown. And Section 49, which deals with powers, privileges and immunities, which secures the freedom of speech and debate, which historically was a powerful instrument for defending the privileges and immunities of the Senate and the House of Representatives, and particularly freedom of speech in debate, which enables the Parliament to express opinions on the conduct of the affairs of the state. It also provides the source of the power of each chamber of the Parliament to summon witnesses or require the production of documents under pain of punishment for contempt. Responsible government means government chosen from those who have the confidence of the House of Representatives. It also requires that, for the most part, the Governor-General acts on ministerial advice. Now, these requirements are matters of convention, not spelt out in the Constitution. Harry Evans was acutely conscious of the importance of maintaining the constitutional role of the Senate in holding the executive accountable to the Parliament and the people through the committee and inquiry processes. In an article written in The Age under the headline Senate Sentinel in 2009, Michelle Grattan described him as a Canberra institution standing up to governments of either hue, advising senators on how they can push their power, clothing parliamentary adventurism in a benign exterior with the loping gait of a weekend bushwalker. Well, his family can testify to that. I've never seen him walking. He authored short but illuminating papers on various aspects of the constitutional role of the Senate. In a paper published in 2001, he quoted two statements by framers of the Constitution which he said illustrated the rationale of the Senate. The first was by Sir Samuel Griffith, first Chief Justice of Australia, whom he characterised as a conservative. Griffith said, it is accepted as a fundamental role of the Senate, of the Federation, that the law shall not be altered without the consent of the majority of the people and also a majority of the states, those speaking by their representatives, referring respectively to the House of Representatives and the Senate. The second quotation was by Dr John Coburn from South Australia, whom he characterised as a radical Democrat. The great principle, which is an essential, I think, to Federation, that the two houses should represent the people truly and should have coordinate powers. They should represent the people in two groups. One should represent the people grouped as a whole and the other should represent them as grouped in the states. Harry Evans had a strong grip of the messy reality of our democracy at work uh, and, he, and the fact that having the numbers does not equate to good government. Uh, in 2006, he described democracy as a necessary but not sufficient condition of good government, observing, to the extent that government in the West has been a more civilised business, presumably than other places, it has not been due to democracy but something far older, constitutionalism, subjecting government itself, even when power is exercised by a majority, to limitations and restraints. It is more important that the rulers know that their power is limited by enforceable rules than that they bask in the mandate of, quote, the people, unquote. His most substantial written legacy lives on in the 14th edition of Odger's Australian Senate Practice as revised by Harry Evans. He produced six editions of the work, the 14th of which was published in 2016, two years after his death. He wrote forcefully and clearly about the role of the Senate in holding executive government to account. He particularly emphasised the importance of the Senate estimates process. And he offered a very clear-eyed vision of the untidiness of accountability. He said accountability is not a refined process which operates on an elevated plane above sordid politics. Accountability operates down in the swamp of politics among the crocodiles and the mosquitoes. The political wetlands sustain our cultural life and biodiversity. Without them, the desert of despotism assumes the landscape. I just love those metaphors. The confidence of the parliament, which is a central element of responsible government, 
is itself only meaningful if there is public confidence in the parliament. Trust in our public institutions may be a questioning or even sceptical trust, but trust in their basic working is fundamental. Sadly, there is evidence of diminishing levels of trust in our institutions in Australia. Earlier this year, a global report under the banner of the Edelman Trust Barometer issued uh, reflecting the results of a survey-based methodology which has been conducted in 28 countries around the world, and this was its 23rd year. The global index is based on what is called an average percent trust in NGOs, business, government and the media. In 2023, Australians were said to have indicated a level of trust measured at 48%, falling for the first time below the halfway mark. Of course, the first question that you might ask is, well, why should the Edelman Trust Barometer be trusted? Perhaps because it accords with what we see ourselves. Causative factors include economic imbalance, institutional shortcomings, class divides, and what the report referred to as the battle for truth. Social media plays a part. As the report said, a shared media environment has given way to echo chambers, making it harder to collaboratively solve problems. Media is not trusted with especially low trust in social media. Australia falls into what the trust barometer calls the field of moderate polarisation, where people see deep divisions but think they might be addressable. Not surprisingly, perhaps the United States falls into what is categorised as severely polarised. Obviously, another element not mentioned in the report, but uh, with which I have uh, a strong interest, is the level of civics education in Australia. People are less likely to trust institutions whose workings they do not understand or of which they are ignorant. Um, civics education in our uh, schools is below par, as indicated in NAPLAN uh, 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 assessments taken out by the National Curriculum Authority, ACARA. Uh, I have a role as Chairman of the Constitutional Education Fund Australia and through that I've become increasingly conscious of the importance of a basic understanding of our democracy by the people whose choices determine its, uh, its government. When it comes to establishing and continuing trust in our key constitutional institutions, which I characterise as the Parliament, the Executive and the Judiciary, the people who operate those institutions are key. If the confidence of the parliament necessary to responsible government is to be meaningful, the people who are elected to the parliament must collectively inspire the confidence of the people who elect them. This requires a basic ethical framework for the discharge of their functions. True also for the executive and the judiciary. A general ethical framework can be stated fairly simply. The holder of a public office must discharge its duties and exercise its powers for the purpose for which the office, for which the office exists and for which the powers are conferred, and only for those purposes and according to the conditions and within the limits of the powers. Now, it's not only an ethical proposition, it also has a legal and constitutional dimension. It encompasses the virtues of honesty, diligence and rationality, but it does not unreasonably constrain. It is not a council of perfection. It allows for the exercise of public power, including legislative power, for a wide range of public purposes, even though they may be contestable and contested on grounds of justice, fairness and workability. Judgments about those things are a matter for the parliament. By way of example, the Australian Parliament has power to make laws under Section 51 of the Constitution, quote, for the peace, order and good government of the Commonwealth on the various subjects which are set out in Section 51. And that, uh, in our Federation, is a familiar form of provision conferring constitutional power on parliaments. It does not legally limit the exercise of lawmaking powers by reference to some vague criterion of peace, order and good government, even though those words appear in the uh, Constitution. It does not authorise the High Court of Australia, for example, to strike down a law on the ground that it is not for the peace, order and good government of the Commonwealth. That judgment, for better or for worse, is a matter for the Parliament, which is ultimately accountable to the people. That said, the exercise of public power is analogous 
to the exercise by a trustee of powers conferred under a trust, and that applies to members of parliament. The idea that election to parliament imposes a trust-like or fiduciary obligation on the elected member goes back a long way. It was applied to individual members of parliament in the 1920s by the High Court of Australia in two cases. One uh, case, Horn and Barber. Mr Horn was a land agent engaged by Mr Barber to try to sell a property to the government of Victoria. Mr Horn engaged a member of the Victorian parliament, Mr Deeney, to act as a lobbyist for the sale, promising him a share of the commission if it went through. Mr Deeney made representations to the relevant minister about the virtues of the property, but did not tell the minister that he was acting in his capacity as a commission agent. A dispute arose between the seller of the land and the land agent about the agent's entitlement to commission. The Supreme Court of Victoria held that the commission agreement was illegal and void because of the involvement of the parliamentarian, and the High Court upheld that decision, emphasising the obligation of members of parliament as an aspect of responsible government. Sir Isaac Isaacs, who was to be appointed as the first Australian-born Governor-General, said in his judgment that when a, I'm sorry for the gendered reference, when a man becomes a member of parliament, he undertakes high public duties. Those duties are inseparable from the position. He cannot retain the honour and divest himself of the duties. One of the duties is that of watching on behalf of the general community the conduct of the executive, of criticising it, and if necessary, of calling it to account in the constitutional way by censure from his place in parliament. Censure, which if sufficiently supported, means removal from office. That is the whole concept of responsible government, which is the keystone of our political system and is the main constitutional safeguard the community possesses. And just as Rich, in the same case, reasoned explicitly in terms of a just a trust relationship. He said, members of parliament are donees of certain powers and discretions entrusted to them on behalf of the community and they must be free to exercise those powers and discretions in the interests of the public, unfettered by considerations of personal gain or profit. So much is required by the policy of the law. Any transaction which has a tendency to injure this trust, uh, a tendency to interfere with this duty, is invalid. And similar statements were made in a later case in 1923 in which another member of parliament um, agreed to receive payments as an inducement to use his position to secure the acquisition of certain lands by the Government of New South Wales. Uh, in that case, there was specific reference to the definition of office or public office in the Oxford Dictionary of the day, which included a position of trust, authority or service under constitutional authority. Justice Higgins made a comparison with private trusteeship and said, he's a member of parliament, holding a fiduciary relation towards the public, and that is enough. Now, that doesn't mean that public trust affecting the way a member should discharge his or her work has a legal effect on the validity of a law passed with the support of a person whose vote has been brought with a bribe. The practical importance of this notion of public trust, which was elucidated back in the 1920s, waned for a while as specific mechanisms were created for the oversight and accountability of public officials. However, as the late Justice Paul Finn pointed out, a loss of faith in those mechanisms in the late 20th century led to renewed interest in the idea of the public trust and its implication for officials and for our system of government itself. So you'll see in codes of conduct for public officials at many levels, the trust or fiduciary concept is invoked. The National Anti-Corruption Commission Act 2022 includes in its definition of corrupt conduct in section eight, any conduct of a public official that involves a breach of public trust. And the term public official is defined in section 10 and includes a parliamentarian. The concept and content of that notion of public trust, of course, no doubt, uh, awaits further fleshing out. The ethical framework that I mentioned and the public trust idea to which it's linked tapped in, tap into a wider concept of responsibility which has a much larger meaning that informs ethics for everybody. That is the idea of responsibility as a response or answer to the myriad questions 
which in our daily life are posed by family, friends, acquaintances, strangers, society, and by events and circumstances which confront us. The great Jewish theologian Martin Buber wrote, we practice responsibility for that realm of life allotted and entrusted to us for which we are able to respond. Where official power is conferred upon an individual or individuals acting collectively, it attracts the application of that large idea of responsibility and the ethical framework which may give practical expression to it. So, responsibility in the exercise of public power has an institutional dimension, but in the end it rests upon the shoulders of each individual who has the right or freedom to participate or contribute to the working of our institutions. The key constitutional responsibilities of Parliament are to make laws and to scrutinise the work of the executive, including the immense amount of delegated legislation and legislative instruments generated by ministers and public officials and institutions. So let me focus for a moment on the lawmaking responsibilities of parliamentarians and then how that links into the way that courts interpret laws and the notion of legislative intention and statutory purpose. The extent and limits of the responsibility of individual parliamentarians in the lawmaking process is not the same in its detailed content for every parliamentarian for every law that the parliament considers. The volume and complexity of modern legislation is that it is simply too much to expect that every member of parliament will have mastered the detail of every element of every law on which they vote and the constitution does not in terms require that of them. We know that the regular process for the passage of a bill into law involves a first, second and third reading, the first something of a formality, the second introduced by a second reading speech which ordinarily sets out the substance and purposes of the proposed law and leads on into substantial debate. Uh, this may be followed by consideration of details of the bill in a committee process in which indiv individual clauses or groups of clauses are agreed to or otherwise. A bill may also be referred to an advisory committee for consideration and may then proceed to a third reading. Sometimes a bill is declared to be urgent and it's rushed through with uh, time limits and a guillotine where time is exhausted and questions necessary to complete that stage of consideration uh, of the bill are put. In this setting, those who vote for a bill may include members who are highly conversant with its provisions. It will include those who are not conversant with the detailed uh, provisions but are across the purpose and effect of the bill as set out in the second reading speech and the explanatory memorandum and perhaps a committee report. And there'll be those who perhaps support a bill because of advice or instructions they have received that the bill is consistent with the policy of the party to which they belong or is otherwise supported by the leadership of the party. Now, this diversity in approach, if you like, to the lawmaking responsibilities and how they are discharged by members of parliament leads us to a consideration of the principles, assumptions and presumptions about lawmaking that courts use when interpreting laws in disputes about their meaning. Here is a question again of institutional and individual responsibility on the parts of courts and judges. Statutory interpretation, the interpretation of laws made by the parliament lies on the constitutional boundary between the lawmaking role of the parliament and the interpretive role of the courts. It's not defined by a clear bright line. In a dispute about the meaning of a law, courts may be faced with two or more reasonably arguable meanings. In interpreting the statute after a contest about it, they will choose one meaning over others. And in such a case, they have what I would call a legitimate small scale lawmaking role because their choice determines what the law is. Sometimes, of course, the meaning is clear and the language allows only one reading. The rules, of course, which they apply to the task of statutory interpretation are generally well known to parliamentary counsel who draft the laws and who will be well aware of the possibility that choices of meaning may arise. The general approach of the courts to the interpretation of a statute is to go first to the words that Parliament has used, that is the text, then to context, that is other provisions of the same law or part of a legislative scheme and there might be a background report from a law reform commission, uh, 
which has given rise to the proposed law. With text and context, the court also looks to the purpose of the law um, or the particular provision being examined. That purpose might be stated in the law itself. It might be apparent from the text and place it in the particular section. It may be stated in the minister's second reading speech. And the courts are directed by Commonwealth law, the Acts Interpretation Act, in section 15 A, which says, in interpreting a provision of an act, the interpretation that would best achieve the purpose or object of the act, whether or not that purpose or object is expressly stated in the act, is to be preferred to each other interpretation. So you have purposive interpretation. Of course, you get some tricky problems sometimes. One of my favourite cases is Doyle and Maypole Bakery, which was decided in the Tasmanian Supreme Court in 1981, uh, where um, a cake shop had a lamington in the front window which had a dead blowfly on an indentation in the icing of the lamington. And the uh, seller of the uh, lamington was charged under the Public Health Act of 1962 with selling uh, um, uh, adulterated food. And the, const the definition of adulterated under the Act was a food which, quote, contains a foreign substance. So the question is, is a dead blowfly lying on top of an indentation in a lamington contained within the lamington? And uh, I guess the purpose of the Act was served by a wide interpretation of contained. And the judge who had a, a literary um, cast uh, quoted from Alexander Pope's essay on criticism, which contained a line saying, so vast a throng the stage could ne'er contain. So there was Alexander Pope using the word contained to describe something on something. So a dead fly, dead blowfly on a lamington was contained within the lamington. And there was another precedent too, the maggots on top of meat were contained in the meat. So it's a lot of interesting jurisprudence developed <laughs> under that. Um, uh, none of the above, uh, of course, requires the court to try to construct an imaginary intention of the parliament, even though we have often spoken in the past in terms of the legislative intention. Of the diversity of understandings which different members of parliament may have in voting for a law and perhaps the diversity of reasons for which they might cast their votes, suggests that for a court to first announce that it has discovered a common legislative intention is to announce that it has constructed a fiction. In a formal sense, legislative intention is said to be ascertained by the court's determination of the meaning of the law, having regard to text, context and purpose. In a case decided in 2011, Six justices of the High Court said that legislative intention is not an objective collective mental state. Such a state is a fiction which serves no useful purpose. Ascertainment of legislative intention is asserted by the court as a statement of its compliance with the rules of construction, both statutory and common law, which have been applied to reach the result that it did and which are known to parliamentary drafters and the courts. In that case, the court also had something to say about the idea of a statutory purpose, which is distinct from legislative intention. The purpose of a statute is not something which exists outside the statute. It resides in its text and structure, albeit it may be identified by reference to common law and statutory rules of interpretation. Now, in saying that, I have to say to you that there is controversy about this approach to legislative intention. There are some uh, legal academics who take a very strong view to the contrary, that it has some uh, real meaning. And Geoffrey Goldsworthy is one who has written quite trenchantly on it. Um, and uh, some of the leading judges in uh, the Supreme Court of uh, the United Kingdom take a different view. What then is the responsibility of the courts when they go to interpreting the law? In making the constructional choices, that is a choice between available meanings, the courts must stay within their constitutional boundaries. They must not trespass into the lawmaking domain of the parliament. Uh, in a case decided in 2012, four justices of the High Court said, in construing a statute, it is not for a court to construct its own idea of a desirable policy, impute it to the legislature and then characterise it as a statutory purpose. Nor is it appropriate for the courts to construe a statute by imposing on it a meaning that the words of the statute will not bear in order to achieve some laudable social purpose. They cannot rewrite the law. Sometimes, of course, a law can be interpreted one way which may 
extinguish or impair rights and freedoms at common law. If interpreted another way, it will not have that effect or will have that effect to a lesser extent. And it's a well-established principle that the courts in such a case prefer the interpretation which avoids or minimises the adverse impact on existing rights and, uh, rights and freedoms. Let me give you an example from when I was on the federal court. Um, we're all familiar now with the character test under the Migration Act, I'm sure. There was a part of that character test, I'm not sure it's identical now, that spoke of association with criminals as being a basis upon which a minister might cancel somebody's visa. And there was a, a, a person, Dr Hanif, uh, who uh, had the uh, misfortune of being related to some people in the United Kingdom who uh, carried out some sort of attempted terrorist act. And his visa was cancelled. The question was, what was the scope of the word associated with criminals necessary to uh, support the ministerial power to cancel a person's visa and result, of course, in their uh, mandatory uh, detention until they could be deported. And the court took the view that, applying that principle of legality, that uh, you don't, uh, the principle of legality being the principle about uh, a narrow construction of uh, uh, terms which impair freedoms, that being associated with criminals is not satisfied by simply being related to them. Uh, so uh, uh, Dr Hanif was uh, uh, vindicated on that occasion. Uh, another uh, uh, example was uh, in 2007 I sat on a full federal court. We had uh, a case involving the visit of the Pope to New South Wales. It was World Youth Day, which is like the Olympics for Catholics. Uh, people come from all over the world, uh, lots of pilgrims. Um, New South Wales passed a World Youth Day Act and under that act they had a regulation making power to do various things and one of the regulations which was made under the act was that a, um, an inspector or officer could direct anybody to cease conduct annoying to pilgrims. <laughs> now there was a bunch called the No to Pope Coalition that wanted to distribute free condoms and generally annoy pilgrims. <laughs> um, and the question was was that regulation a valid exercise of the regulation making power? And um, using uh, the, uh, uh, by reference to the common law freedom of speech, not a constitutional one, the common law freedom of speech and respect for freedom of speech, we said that the regulation making power did not in, extend so far as to authorise a regulation which had that potential impact on uh, expressive uh, conduct. So I don't know how the uh, No to Pope Coalition went, but it all seemed to go down pretty smoothly. The principle is similar to that which is found in human rights legislation in Victoria, Queensland and the Australian Territory. There, uh, the laws require that the courts should interpret state or territory legislation consistently with fundamental human rights and freedoms which are set out in the Act and taken from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And we have interpreted that requirement under the Victorian human rights legislation as going no further than the common law principle of legality approach, which I've already described. That is, the court can only choose a meaning which is reasonably open on the text of the legislation being interpreted, um, and it chooses the meaning which is least uh, impactful, if you like, on those uh, uh, specified rights and freedoms. The English courts have taken a more robust approach, and they uh, seem to take an approach that allows them to some extent to almost rewrite a provision. For us, that's going beyond the constitutional boundaries. The responsibility of the courts to stay within their constitutional boundaries is also clear when it comes to deciding whether a law made by the parliament is beyond the lawmaking power of the, of the, of, of the constitution. It's a big decision to strike a law down. And the first question the court must ask is, what does the text of the challenged law mean? Is there an interpretation open that lies within the scope of the Parliament's lawmaking power, even though on another interpretation the law would be beyond the scope of the power? And the Interpretation Act says that every act shall be read and construed subject to the Constitution and so as not to exceed the legislative power of the Commonwealth. And to the extent that any enactment um, would but for this section have been construed as being in excess of that power, it shall nevertheless be a valid enactment to the extent to which it is not in excess of that power. So the first task for a court in dealing with a constitutional challenge to a statutory provision, as we have seen recently in uh, the indefinite detention case, 
is to say what is the, uh, how do we interpret the section? Is it possible in to, to interpret the section under challenge in such a way that it falls within uh, constitutional power? And um, uh, the first task which the High Court undertook in its recent decision about the mandatory detention provisions of the Migration Act was to determine whether the relevant provisions could be interpreted so as not to authorise a punitive indefinite detention. Now, they'd previously held that they couldn't be interpreted any other way. And the court said, we're not going to overrule that previous, that aspect of the previous decision. So they had to front up to the constitutional question uh, as to whether that section was, uh, was valid. And uh, it left the court to deal with that question. They could not interpret their way out of having to deal with that question. And of course, that happens from time to time. Uh, as appears from the recent decision, constitutional interpretation can take the court into hotly contested areas of political sensitivity. Uh, important High Court decisions uh, and more generally decisions, uh, for example, dealing with executive action and challenging challenges to executive action can sometimes involve areas of significant political consequence, even though the court is not making the decision on political grounds. The common law decision of Mabo and the decision of Wick that followed it are two good examples. I mean, the intensity of the passions generated by Wick was well illustrated by the member for Kalgoorlie, who on national television described the members of the High Court as pissants. <laughs> uh, this was not a spooner, it was not a malapropism for puissant. It was, uh, <laughs> it was a denunciation, well, it was part of our robust democracy, I suppose, but it reflected the political implications of that decision with some of you, the history of which some of you may be uh, familiar with. Similarly, when I was on the court, we made a decision about the validity of an exercise of ministerial power in the Malaysian declaration case as to whether or not uh, we could uh, declare Malaysia a third or the minister had validly declared Malaysia a country to which um, uh, asylum seekers held in Australia could be transferred. And whilst from a legal point of view that was a fairly routine question of, uh, const of um, uh, judicial review of the exercise of an executive power and whether or not conditions under the Act for that declaration had been satisfied, it did have a very significant political implications. Uh, of course, if you uh, interpret the Constitution, uh, it has much bigger significance because you can fix up uh, an interpretation of the law by changing the law, which is what happened with the, uh, the Migration Act. Constitutional interpretation by the High Court can only be, um, uh, the effect of it can only be changed either by an amendment to the Constitution using a referendum or by the High Court deciding to change its mind in a later case. Um, so uh, 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 these, are, these are areas of political sensitivity, but notwithstanding their political sensitivity, the court has the obligation to uh, uphold the rule of law, whether it is in interpretation of the constitution or review of uh, executive action. And the court has uh, gone a long way uh, in the what I call the judicial protection of the rule of law. Uh, and this is um, uh, the rule of law in relation to, again, executive action. It has in a series of cases, and legislative action, in a series of cases since 1996, the High Court has interpreted the provisions of Chapter 3 of the Constitution relating to the judicature so as to protect the institutional integrity of courts and their essential characteristics, uh, both federal, uh, federal, state and territory, from legislative intrusions. So state parliaments can't abolish the state Supreme Courts and they can't deprive the state Supreme Courts of their traditional supervisory jurisdiction over executive action, by which I mean uh, their ability to entertain challenges to executive action, which is said to be beyond the limits of, uh, of uh, executive power. The High Court itself has such a jurisdiction under Section 75.5 of the uh, Constitution. In this area, uh, in judicial review of executive action, uh, the courts have a responsibility, as with the other areas of statutory interpretation and constitutional interpretation, to stay within their boundaries. It is no part of the court's function in a particular case to decide that they would prefer the executive to have made a different decision uh, or to step into the shoes of the executive and make such a decision. Uh, 
And uh, in uh, uh, an often quoted statement, uh, Justice Brennan said uh, back in 1990 that the duty and jurisdiction of the court to review administrative actions do not go beyond the declaration and enforcing of the law which determines the limits and governs the exercise of the repository's powers. In so doing, the court avoids administrative... If in so doing, the court avoids administrative injustice or error, so be it. But the court has no jurisdiction simply to cure administrative injustice or error. The merits of administrative action, to the extent that they can be distinguished from legality, are for the repository of the relevant power and subject to political control for the repository alone. Now, those words, subject to political control, are the words that pick up uh, the element of responsible government, which involves parliamentary scrutiny of executive action. Generally speaking, the courts require of the executive exercising statutory powers that they comply with um, what I call the logic of the statute so that the reasoning process of an executive decision maker exercising a statutory power must be a reasoning process, not a throw of the dice. It must be consistent with a statutory purpose based upon a correct interpretation of the statute, having regard to those things which the parliament has required in the law uh, have to be considered and disregarding those things which are irrelevant. And it must involve findings of fact um, which are necessary conditions of the exercise of the, of the power. Uh, there is a, another criterion as well, um, and that is the valid exercise of power may require more than just rationality and logic. It must also require, at the, at the boundaries, reasonableness. The decision-maker exercising a statutory power may tick all the logical boxes and yet make an unreasonable decision. Metaphorically speaking, it might be rational to use a sledgehammer to crack a peanut, but it might not be reasonable. And you can track that analogy through to uh, administrative decision-making. Now, so far I've considered the role of the courts in determining cases in which it may be said that the executive government through its various public officials and ministers has exceeded the power conferred on it by statute, that is, by a law made by the parliament. Now, there's another ill-defined area of executive power that is more troublesome, and that is power which comes directly from the constitution and not from a law made by the parliament in the exercise of the lawmaking powers. And you'll see in section 61 of the constitution that the executive power of the Commonwealth extends to the execution and maintenance of the constitution and of the laws of the Commonwealth. So it goes beyond statutory power. And there are powers that the executive has which come directly from the, um, from the constitution. Uh, their scope is uncertain, um, but they have been explored more recently uh, through uh, decisions about executive spending power. And earlier on in the case uh, involving the uh, scope of executive power in relation to um, uh, non-statutory interdiction of um, asylum seekers. Uh, it's reasonably well established that what I call non-statutory executive power enables the Commonwealth to undertake executive actions appropriate to its position under the Constitution. Now that's sometimes called the nationhood power and it also picks up prerogative powers historically accorded to the Crown under the common law, like the power to declare war, for example, and which are relevant to the functions of the Commonwealth. An important aspect of non-statutory executive power, which has come under scrutiny in the courts in recent times, has been the power of the executive to enter into contracts and to spend public money. And this question was one which concerned Harry Evans. Back in 2005, the High Court in Combay and the Commonwealth held that the government's industrial relations advertising campaign was an authorised purpose of expenditure under appropriations made by the Parliament for the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations. It was a very broad form of appropriation and Evans observed that there was very little limitation on the purposes for which money may be spent. And having regard to the broad brush appropriations held lawful by the court, he said it is now clear that control of expenditure must be undertaken by the parliament or not at all. But is it enough that a proposed expenditure is covered by an appropriation of money by the parliament uh, in order to make it lawful? The answer to that question is no, 
The executive cannot spend money simply on the basis of a parliamentary appropriation. Parliamentary appropriation is a necessary condition of spending power, but it is not sufficient. The power to spend money, and thus the power to contract to spend money entering into government contracts, must be found either in the Constitution itself, some source of non-statutory executive power, or in a valid law made under the Constitution, in other words, a statute which authorises the expenditure for a particular purpose. And that proposition emerges from three cases decided by the High Court in 2009, 2012 and 2014. And I just mentioned them very briefly. The first was um, the validity of the Tax Bonus for Working Australians Act. Remember the, the um, global financial crisis? Uh, the government decided uh, that uh, fiscal stimulus was a good policy. They're going to boost confidence. Every taxpayer would get a cheque and they'd all go out and buy flat screen televisions or something and so we'd stay afloat while the rest of the world went down. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, Tax Bonus Act uh, was passed. Uh, Brian Pape, a lecturer in law at the University of New England, would have been entitled to $250 under Section 7 of the Act. He didn't want it. And what's more, he said that they, the Commissioner of Taxation, who was to dole out the money, uh, did not have the power to do that because the legislation was invalid. Justices Gummo, Crennan, Bell and I held that the determination by the executive government of a need for an immediate fiscal stimulus to the national economy was a valid exercise of executive power and could be supported by legislation under section 5139 of the Constitution, which is the power to make laws incidental to uh, the uh, exercise of powers by the Commonwealth. Mr Pape lost his challenge. I described him as the man who tried to bite the hand that tried to feed him. He, he represented himself in the uh, uh, High Court. He was a, a charming and uh, engaging uh, advocate. Sadly, he has uh, passed away since that time. An important principle which emerged from his loss was a win for his view of the executive power of the Commonwealth in relation to public expenditure. And that was the proposition that sections 81 and 83 of the Constitution do not confer substantive spending power. Appropriation is a necessary condition of such expenditure. And the power to spend appropriated monies is to be found elsewhere in the Constitution or in statutes made under it. So you have to have an appropriation, but that's not enough. You have to have a source of power which you can identify directly. Now that case set the scene for the next two cases, Williams number one and Williams number two, and Mr Williams was uh, uh, challenging uh, Commonwealth expenditure under a contract with the Scripture Union for the provision of chaplaincy services in schools in uh, Queensland. Um, and uh, the question was, there was, an, uh, there was an appropriation, but the appropriation was not enough. What was the source of power? So there was a, a common assumption which had existed up to that time that the executive could spend money, if it had an appropriation, on anything about which the parliament could make a law. In other words, any head of Commonwealth power. And uh, the, short, the long and the short of it is that the court said, no, you can't simply spend money on something about which a law might have been made, and then you have to imagine some hypothetical law which might have been made, and there might be a variety of such things. There has to be a law, or else a power derived from the constitution itself. Well, in response to that, uh, uh, decision, the Commonwealth enacted the Financial Framework Legislation Amendment Act, which was um, putting it in very broad terms, an act which said, well, every expenditure we make is supported by this law under whatever head of power of the Commonwealth uh, we can <laughs> apply. Um, and uh, what they tell us um, uh, uh, the, 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 is that the legislation uh, was an attempt at what I call a global fix providing a legislated substitute for the common assumption that had previously existed. Uh, it validated everything that could be validated. Whether it did so validly may be debatable. Uh, 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 and in the particular case, Williams number two, we found there was no relevant head of power for the, uh, for the uh, expenditure, uh, so that section, the, the amendment did not, did, not, did not fix it. You had to have a head of power to um, plug into that amendment. So the general question that arises from this is how is the executive held to account? The judicial process is an ad hoc mechanism of accountability. It is not systematically, systematic. 
Ultimately, as Harry Evans said after Combe, it's the Parliament. In a submission to the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit inquiring into Commonwealth Grants Administration in October 2022, Anne Toomey, who has delivered two of these lectures on previous occasions, said, those who actively approve the grants are rarely aware of the limits on their powers that are derived from the limited legislative support for the spending program. As a result, in her opinion, much of the expenditure under grants schemes is unlawful or at least of doubtful legal validity. Uh, in her typically blunt way, she said, this needs to stop. <laughs> Governments should not be unlawfully expending public money. The principle of the rule of law means that the law, including this constitution, binds the government in relation to the expenditure of public money. Her concern does not appear to have led to any response uh, in the committee's report. The question remains, who is accountable for the lawfulness of public expenditure, quite apart from the ethical integrity of grants programs, and to whom are they accountable? Um, that, that's a question which I think uh, is um, uh, not going to be answered soon. There are few people who are prepared to come to court to challenge the validity of a payment made by the Commonwealth. There is therefore a practical limit on the accountability which can be imposed by the courts in relation to contracts and payments made under them. Responsible government trumps judicial review every time. The parliament does not have to wait for a case to come before it in order to examine the lawfulness and merits of public expenditure. Sometimes, of course, it may not be politically prudent to challenge a popular program. But if responsible government is to mean anything, it must mean that the executive is accountable to the parliament for its use of public money and that the exercise of accountability mechanisms is an exercise of that public trust function, which I referred to in describing the role of um, parliamentarians. In conclusion, across our constitutional system, there are many calls for its actors, the institutions and the people who make them up to respond ethically to the public interest and the public purposes which they are called to serve. The idea of responsible government is at the centre of that picture. The ethical framework offers a larger picture. People like Harry Evans, a true servant of the public who carried out the duties of the clerk of the Senate, are models for everybody everywhere, whether they be in the parliament, the executive or on the bench. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr French, for your, your insightful and, and uh, entirely contemporaneous uh, observations. Um, I was expecting a, a journey through responsible government, ethical framework, public trust. I, I wasn't expecting you to use my absolute favourite um, quote from Harry about accountability occurring down in the swamp of politics <laughs> among the crocodiles and mosquitoes. And we went from mosquitoes to a blowfly. Um, the no to Pope coalition and Alexander Pope. I, I really think that we got a little bit of everything there. We do have um, uh, a little bit of time for questions and uh, we have uh, some of our staff with microphones at the, the sides of the uh, theatre if, if anyone does want to ask a question. If, if you do, I'd, I'd hope that the questions will be short and searching rather than meandering in their, uh, <laughs> their construction. It doesn't look like anyone's... Are talking about question time here? <laughs> <laughs> One of the great things about question time is we set the clock. Um, that wasn't always the way. We do have a question um, up here. Ophelia. Uh, thank you. Is that right? Yeah, thank you for your lecture. That was really phenomenal. I'm just interested in what um, you think in terms of... You mentioned um, the circumstances in which Parliament um, considers legislation, the ind how individual members and senators examine um, legislation before they go to a vote, and um, the implications that can have further down the line for um, judicial review. I'm wondering if you think that there are um, any th there is should be stronger constitutional checks before um, things get voted on. So whether the parliament does a sufficient job in identifying whether laws are strong enough to withstand constitutional review. Uh, I, I think it would be um, whether you do that. As, I mean, there's a lot of law that is plainly constitutionally uncontroversial. Uh, but um, 
in those, uh, I would have thought that as a matter of prudence, um, uh, the, uh, the minister, if advised, for example, takes advice that there is a constitutional question, but on balance it looks good, um, should disclose that advice to the parliament uh, so that uh, if the parliament feels that that's an issue that needs to be scrutinised in debate, it can be. I imagine that uh, uh, examination of constitutionality uh, um, is something that could arise ordinarily out of the process of debate with interested members, but that has to be an engaged and interested member, of course, using maybe uh, the, parliamentary, uh, the, the parliamentary library or personal research assistance to look at that. There are other cases, of course, where the political imperatives of pushing a particular law through may mean that uh, constitutional concerns are, are sidelined or the risk is taken. But I think uh, generally that uh, Parliament, uh, you can say as a, as a high level of abstraction, high principle, that uh, Parliament has a responsibility to legislate within the limits of its powers and that means informing itself about the limits of its powers. If I could comment on that slightly. Um, uh, alarmingly, uh, there was a bill in the last parliament, I think it was in the last parliament, on which the um, minister and departmental officials refused to disclose to not one but two different parliamentary committees what the constitutional head of power was for the bill that they were asking those committees to examine. Maybe I didn't know. <laughs> That's, that, that, it didn't occur to me that that might be the, 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 the problem. Do you have another couple of questions on this side of the chamber? Chamber. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long, a long sitting period. My question was about uh, responsible government and the reference you made early in your talk about uh, civics education. How do we? Uh, convey simply to the public and particularly young people the importance of responsible government um, in a simple way, in a way that doesn't draw on these very nuanced um, aspects of the mechanisms required to keep democracy tacked together. Yeah, look, it, it's a tough call. Um, uh, one of the things that the Constitutional Education Fund Australia has been involved with is as an adjunct to the Australian Constitutional Centre of the High Court is the development of uh, uh, teacher resources. Um, and um, Anne Toomey's had a, a strong hand in, in that development. I think they're shortly to go up. There was a final review by the Department of Education. Uh, they're shortly to go up. But just having the resources available, of course, um, which are usable by teachers, uh, is not enough. You've got to make sure that it's treated, given a priority role in the curriculum. If you look at the civics and citizenship aspect of the national curriculum put out by ACARA, it covers a range of things and it doesn't necessarily have a focus on the basic workings of our democracy. And I think that's fundamental. So that what we have to do is to, um, uh, uh, if you like, advocate for uh, uh, exposure to these things from the very earliest possible stage, even you know, late primary school. Um, the NAPLAN assessments which are carried out by ACARA um, of uh, standards of proficiency in relation to various elements of its, of its curricula indicated over two successive, I think the last one was 2021 or something, uh, that year six and year nine were both falling, year six and year 10 I think, were both falling below the proficiency standards. Now, the deficit was skewed um, according to social and economic uh, categories and also um, Indigenous people and so forth. And I think also there would probably be a challenge with uh, relatively recent migrant communities who come from different sort of uh, constitutional and uh, government setups. Yeah, I think there's a huge job to be done there and I think it's one of increasing urgency because we have ignorance of the basic workings of our democracy. People will pick it up from television, social media, and you get what I call the, the snake oil salesman have room to come in and peddle the sort of nonsense that we hear from time to time. I think we did have one more question. Uh, we have time for one more question anyway, so. 
see where the microphone links. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. French. I'm just very interested to hear your views on the recent developments following the NZYQ case. Um, I'm particularly interested in any commentary or insights you might be able to provide us uh, on the time delay in the High Court, um, providing its reasons following the orders that it gave, uh, and uh, the consequences of the ruling and the interplay with the, the legislative response, um, noting, of course, that the Migration Amendment Bill was passed in one day, uh, bypassing the, the process that you've outlined for us today. Yeah, well, uh, retired generals shouldn't criticise the generals who've taken over from them or comment on their <laughs> strategies. So uh, it's not for me to uh, offer, and I won't offer comments uh, on uh, the particular uh, merits of the process which the High Court adopted. I, I would say that there have been precedents in the past uh, where, for example, one had a criminal case and the High Court was um, um, uh, of the view by at least a majority that the conviction should be quashed and an acquittal should be entered. In other words, no, no retrial uh, at the end of the road that, uh, um, and somebody's in prison serving a term, that you would announce that immediately and sometimes give reasons, give reasons later uh, because of the, uh, the, the general proposition that no one should spend a day longer in unlawful detention uh, than, uh, than is possible. Um, so um, there's that kind of uh, precedent. We have uh, also another case, I think in PAPE, in fact, because of the urgency of the, um, of the uh, measure, we gave a result, uh, gave, an order, gave orders upholding the validity of the law and, and then um, gave reasons later. I think we did the same in Roe, which was a case involving uh, ch a challenge to provisions of the amendment to the Electoral Act which uh, contracted the uh, um, act, uh, period of grace for people to get late enrolments in. And we held that that was, um, that um, uh, the amendment was invalid and we gave reasons that we had to do that because the electoral office had to get on with uh, uh, determining who was on the register. So there have been those, uh, there have been those sorts of precedents in the past uh, with orders given and reasons delivered later. I noticed in Harry Evans' discussion of combat, I couldn't remember whether this is right or not, he, he seemed to refer to the reasons uh, and that it, I think in combat the reasons may have been given after the decision because the question of the advertising of the, uh, the uh, proposed industrial relations law was of some urgency. And I, I don't want to comment on the processes surrounding the bill because it's a kind of political controversy. We, we, um we tried to adopt in clerkly circles the same idea that uh, retired generals don't uh, comment on the, the behaviour or, or, or uh, activities of, of uh, the current generals. So um, I appreciate Rosemary being here today and she's always been very respectful of uh, the way in which I've attempted to run my time as clerk of the Senate. Um, that is all that we, we've got, um, got time for um, uh, a recording of this lecture and information about future lectures will be available on the Senate Lecture Series page on the APH website. That's aph.gov.au. Um, if you're not already subscribed, can I encourage you to sign up for our email subscriber list. Um, there's a sign-up sheet at the exit table, or it says here you can also email us at research.sen at aph.gov.au. That concludes our formal proceedings and the 2020 Senate Lecture Series. It just remains for me to ask you to join me in again thanking Mr French for delivering today's superb lecture. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.